minute. So you should finish up your uh, uh, the audience should finish up its conversation. Do I, need to Do I need to repeat that the audiences should finish up their conversations over there on the, my on my left? The union thugs. <laughs> Thank you. It's always good to have a union thug, especially in this committee. <laughs> Members, I'm going to call the Jobs and Economic Development Finance and Poli Development Finance and Policy Committee to order. We have one bill in front of us today. It is the Chair's bill, uh, and it is the bill that deals with or has been <coughs> sent to us from the um, the Work Comp Advisory Board or Council. Uh, it's a bill that we uh, that has. It has taken a while to come to, com to committee, and I believe that uh, although not everybody loves this particular bill, it is a bill that uh, addresses some concerns and some issues. So uh, with that, I will uh, go to the witness table and present my bill. I will ask the Vice Chair, Representative Purcell, to come on over and uh, take over the committee. Hopefully you will be kind to the Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say break a leg, but there's too many union people in here. It's not too early for laughing, is it? Yes. Come on. Control home. yourself. I just wanted I just wanted everyone to know that we're on TV this morning. <laughs> Um, okay. Good. Members, uh, we are going to be working off of House File 1359. It is in the possession of the committee. Uh, it has been sent back from the from rules, so we don't have to take it off the table. But I would like to move <coughs> House File 1359 for consideration. With having said that, there are a total of five amendments. And the author of the bill has two. Uh, they are the A13-0478, <coughs> which is a primary amendment. And then there is the A13-0534. Uh, and members, those are author's amendments. So I will um, do a little bit of explanation on the... Uh, uh, on what these amendments are. So, Mr. Chair. Do you want to move those amendments too? I would then, like then? to move the A13-0478. This is a um, an amendment. This is the Work Comp Advisory Council's uh, uh, work that they put together over the last year. Uh, and it was an agreement that covers a variety of issues and areas, and I have the uh, assistant commissioner here uh, that will explain the whole bill once we get it in the shape that the author would like. So, Mr. Chair, I would move the uh, the amendment and ask for a vote. Okay, so we've uh, we've moved the uh, 0478 amendment and uh, ask for uh, any discussion on that at this time. Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? I have the amendment. Mr. And Chair, I would move the A13 0534 amendment. And what this, and I'll explain it if you'll give me a minute. Please. Um, there has been, there was some concern with the uh, original language. Uh, it was, in a couple of places, it was more broad than it needed to be. Uh, that is line, uh, and that is dealt with on line 1.3, and 1.4, 1.5. Um, and then section 14, starting on line, where it says section 14, reimbursement cost study, starting on line 1.8, uh, there was some concern uh, on a number of groups' part about a, uh, a part of the bill, uh, which dealt with a court decision, and wisely the council has decided to study it for a year and come back to the uh, legislature uh, after they get all parties that are concerned about this 
to work out uh, the best way forward. And what this is is a study on, am I saying it correctly, the SPA? Spaith uh, court decision. Uh, and because that actually does need to be addressed, this, uh, this amendment will bring forth all parties that have a concern with this to have a conversation about how best to deal with that. And it requires them to, as you can see, um, <coughs> is to talk about the health care provider reimbursement system. It's not limited to uh, carry, uh, administrative costs, prompt pay, uniform claim components, and effect on provider reimbursement and the injured worker. Uh, and the commissioner shall consult with interested stakeholders, including the health care providers, workers, comp insurance carriers, and representatives of business and labor to provide relevant data promptly to the department uh, to complete the study. And it is calls for the study to be reported back to us December 13, 2013. Um, most, uh, most everyone has signed off on this particular amendment. There is one member of the uh, Work Comp Advisory Council who has some concerns. Hopefully they can be addressed. But I would uh, ask that the, uh, the legislature and my colleagues in, the, uh, in, in this committee uh, put this on so it's in the shape that the authors would like. We'll have the department explain the bill. We'll call up witnesses. I know there is one other uh, amendment here. And after the uh, Work Comp Advisory Council's witnesses, we will deal with the, second, the other amendment if, we, if that is so the body, uh, will of the body. Okay, so uh, do we have any uh, discussion to the 0534? Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Newt. Uh, question, uh, Chair Mahoney. On, this is a negotiated settlement, negotiated agreement. If we have amendments to that, does it have to go back for negotiation or has have the parties all signed off on these as well as we've got some other amendments coming up? Uh, Mr. Zimmer. Chair, Representative Newton, um, about two or three weeks ago, well, whenever this uh, first agreement came to our attention, uh, I'm not sure about the rest of the members on the committee, but I was inundated with people rushing to my office saying that they were not heard. Um, uh, the council has wisely decided that that could easily have been the case and that they needed to listen to people. So the witnesses, after after the um, the department explains the bill, we will bring up the leaders of the work comp advisory council, both from labor and from industry, and they will attest to the fact that this is a compromise that they all agree on. Thank you. Any other discussion? For the 0534 amendment. Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, we have the bill in the shape the author prefers. And uh, if we could have the... Mr. Chair, committee yeah. members, I would like to uh, ask the assist the department, uh, the Assistant Commissioner, Chris Eiton, to uh, explain the bill uh, so that I can uh, pick her brain as I get ready to take it to the House floor when you all start asking me questions without a backup. Very good. If you'd introduce yourself for the record, please, and proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. <clears throat> My name is Chris Iden, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Labor and Industry. And I'll go through the amended bill. And as uh, the Chair noted, this has been approved by the Workers' Comp Advisory Council. Section 1 provides coverage for post traumatic stress disorder. It amends the definition of occupational disease to include that. Similarly, Section 2 includes post-traumatic stress disorder in the definition of personal injury. So under both uh, types of injury, post-traumatic stress disorder would be covered. <coughs> Section 3 raises the cap on attorney's fees from 13000 to 26000 and the term cap is used fairly loosely. An attorney can always petition the court to get additional fees, but this is a statutory cap that uh, an attorney could receive without petitioning the court. 
Section 4 pertains to attorney fee reimbursement. And under current law, an insurance company is required to reimburse an injured worker for 30% of the attorney's fees over $250. And sometimes there will be cases where the insurer actually pays the employee's attorney directly. And that's where there are no indemnity benefits involved in the dispute. It might be a case that involves only medical expenses or rehab expenses. But under current law, the insurer would still be required to reimburse the employee, even though the employee did not pay any fees. So se Section 4 is intended to correct that. Under Section 5, the maximum weekly benefit that an in injured worker can receive is changed from a flat $850 per week to 102% of the statewide average weekly wage. Under Section 6, certain job development services will be limited. They will be limited to 20 hours a month for the first three months. And then at that point, if the parties want to extend those services, or if one of the parties wants to extend them, they would have to go to the department or to an administrative law judge. And then those services could be extended for a total of six months. And those services are limited in terms of what's being capped. These services would include contacting prospective employers, identifying job openings, and arranging interviews. So it's not all the services that a QRC or other providers uh, provide. Under Section 7, a disability, a QRC that provides disability case management services could not later provide statutory rehabilitation services to the same employee. Uh, section 8 would put rehabilitation conferences on the fast track. This amendment would require the department or OAH to hold a rehab conference when there's a dispute about rehab services within 21 days of the date of the request. Section 9 amends the definition of prevailing charge. And right now, hospitals are generally reimbursed at 85% of their usual and customary charge, or 85% of the prevailing charge. And insurers and other payers can determine the prevailing charge by getting 20 examples of a particular service and averaging those out. Under current law, the payor can only go back a year. This amendment would allow them to go back two years because there could be some services that are fairly unique and getting 20 examples during a year might be difficult. Under Section 10, there are changes made to COLA. The cap on COLA benefit, the, the cap on COLA increases for benefits would increase from 2 to 3 percent. There would be no change in benefits if the COLA is less than zero. And the date on which COLA increases are triggered would be changed from the fourth anniversary of the date of injury to the third anniversary. Under Section 11, the commissioner has the authority, is given the authority to enact rules that would require an injured employee to enter into a contract with their physician if they're being prescribed narcotics for long-term use. And that's the general medical standard as we understand it. But we did not believe that the commissioner had the authority to require an injured worker to enter into an agreement. So this amendment gives the commissioner that authority. Under Section 12, a patient advocate pilot program would be established. This would be a two-year program. And the goal is that this uh, person would assist and provide information to injured workers that have suffered back injury or are considering some sort of spinal surgery. And the main thrust of that is to make sure employees get the information they need to make an informed decision. And the last section establishes a reimbursement cost study. And as the chair indicated, uh, there is a court decision called the Spaith decision that um, allows hospitals and other health care providers 
to receive reimbursement through the work comp system even though they may have already been reimbursed by a health insurer so they would get the differential and this study will study the effects of repealing or overturning that decision as well as looking at some other reforms and costs uh, in the system in the workers comp system that um, could be looked at for cost savings and that study would have to be completed before the end of this year. And I can address any questions anyone might have. Do we, thank you, Commissioner Item. Any questions for Commissioner Item at this point? Mr. Chair? Representative Mahoney. Uh, seeing no questions, we might want to bring that one. Uh, yeah, uh, Representative Item. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. I just have a quick question for you on section six. Uh, the section, and I'm just asking for my own information here. This section limits job development services to 20 hours per week for three months. Um, has it always been 20 hours a week, or is this a change? This is a change. There, From what? There was not currently. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Thank Mr. You. Chair, uh, members. This is a change. There is not currently a limit. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. There's this would be a change. There is not currently a cap. There is not currently a cap. Correct. Okay. Other questions this time? Uh, yes. Um, <coughs> Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I don't know. Um, I did hear a few concerns from the county on Section 2, and I just want to make sure that we understand and, and can explain um, that maybe this wouldn't have a, a big fiscal impact on the counties? Um, Commissioner Ryder. Mr. Chair, members, the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder is taken from the medical publication that defines <coughs> uh, various illnesses. And so the scope of this amendment, or the scope of this provision is very narrow. It would only cover individuals who are unable to perform their duties as a result of the diagnosis of PTSD. And right now, I believe 30 states cover some sort of mental health disease or injury. Minnesota is one of the few that does not. And this would be a very narrow step forward in terms of providing that coverage. And Mr. Chairman Fabian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Deputy Commissioner, this is one of the scenarios that came to me from one of my small town providers. Person comes in with a work comp injury. Uh, they start the paperwork. Uh, they file it as a work comp claim. The work comp claim is denied. So then they file the claim with their insurance company, and the insurance company pays. In the meantime, they filed an appeal with work comp. Uh, now, after the insurance claim has been paid, for whatever reason, work comp decides that this is a payable claim, so they pay the claim. The small provider writes out a check to the insurance company so that they're not getting double pay for the same, and, and everything was working out just fine for them. It was brought to my attention that the possibility existed that that mechanism would no longer be in effect uh, with, with the new, and I talked to Chair Mahoney about this. I, I need to be clear that that if a claim is filed and it's denied, um, they go and file a claim with the insurance company. Uh, is that all still going to be in place with this bill? I think that's covered maybe in Section 10, but I'm not sure. Commissioner Ryder. Mr. Chair, members, if I'm understanding your example correctly, that would not change. If an injured <coughs> worker files a work comp claim, the claim is denied, and that worker gets treated, the health insurer would pay for that treatment. Later, the work comp claim is approved. At that point, the health care provider would be entitled to be reimbursed whatever additional funds they would have received under work comp. <coughs> oh, this. Rip Jim Mahoney. And, and that's what, uh, Representative, uh, uh, that is what the, uh, the amendment did with the study, so that they will have to come back, hopefully, 
they all get in a smoke filled room and you know close the door and have a conversation and come up with a good decision on how to move forward on this and then they have to bring it back to us so that's what the uh, the 0534 amendment was and it, it, it eliminated the possibility that your hospital or a hospital of any of ours uh, would suffer great great damage with this this bill without having some conversation some more conversation about it but there still is the opportunity and everybody needs to come to the table and have a conversation and, and over the next year so I because I do not want to have uh, a stalled bill for uh, any length of time once the work comp advisory council comes back with a, a recommendation Representative Pavin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it'll be interesting to hear what the testimony is from uh, the providers that come to the table to make sure that we are clear on that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I need to go back to my previous question on Section 6. Uh, why did we limit it to 20 hours? Commissioner Wright. Mr. Chair, hmm? members. Uh, this was a negotiated part of a package that, as you can tell, includes a lot of varying conditions. Sure. Uh, I don't know specifically how 20 hours was selected. I can tell you that after this uh, proposal was made, the department looked at our internal rehab services mm -hmm. because we do have a unit that provides those services. And I don't believe there was any case in the sampling that we had that the hours provided exceeded 20 hours a month. Mm -hmm. So it, it did seem from the department's experience to be a reasonable cap. I will say it wasn't a scientific study, mm -hmm. but the random cases we took um, would have fallen below that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. I appreciate that. I'm, uh, for the record, uncomfortable with a 20-hour cap. Thank you. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, for the Deputy Commissioner, uh, in, um, under Section 2, Subdivision 16, describes uh, personal injury or mental impairment that arises out of or in the course of employment, but it does not cover an employee well. My, my question here is, <clears throat> would seem that we're dealing with, with folks that go into occupations that uh, in some cases uh, require extraordinary measures to be undertaken in terms of to carry out their, their duties as it would be compared to like a firefighter, uh, as would compare to a um, paramedic. And I'm just wondering if you can for the, the, the committee give any definitional <coughs> help in terms of what is normal and customary to those occupations and what would be considered uh, extraordinary and or unusual. Because I can see when we're running in the range of a PTSD, how do you frame what is normal and customary and what is unusual and uncustomary to that position in terms of when you're making a claim. And I'm not trying to be derogatory in any way, shape, or form because my, my daughter is a paramedic and I, I've heard already some stories that might, might curl even the chair's hair. <laughs> or represent Isaacson's hair. <laughs> <laughs> this is the choice. <laughs> 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 that point, uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair, just for a matter of record, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with that comment. No. <laughs> <laughs> so to the deputy, if you Fabian. could just, uh, you know, throw us a, <laughs> Mr. Chair, if you could just uh, respond, throw us a lifeline for some definitional help on that one. Commissioner Ryan. Mr. Chair, members, um, I don't know how much clarity I can add to that. Um, I think what was considered when this was proposed were cases um, such as that that occurred in Red Lake, where there was a teacher who witnessed 
a horrific shooting and had reactions and PTSD following that. There are certainly professions that uh, put a person in a position where they will see horrific things on a more regular basis. I guess it's just going to depend, depend on the individual. What might cause me to have PTSD could be very different than what might cause Representative Mahoney to have PTSD. And it's just going to be decided on an individual case. I would suspect that people that go into those professions probably can handle witnessing those kinds of events better than me or you. But I cannot give you any firm lines as to what the distinction is between usual and customary in one occupation and usual and customary in another. Representative Albright. For the chair and for the author in this regard, then, do you, is it your a desire or impression that the study that would be undertaken would be um, helpful in clarifying that, uh, that question as well? Representative Mahoney. Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, uh, I don't think the study that in, in Section 13 would really deal with that. Uh, I believe, uh, as I think it's on page three, line four, uh, the most recent edition of, uh, and actually the, the language was changed a little bit on that, but it still refers back to the editions of, uh, published edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, published by the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, that's a pretty broad uh, book, so to speak. Uh, I know I've been on some police ride-alongs that uh, were pretty horrific. Uh, you know, it, I didn't, I wasn't that affected by it, but apparently a couple of the police officers were, and uh, they sought some help. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there was my my stepson the other day drove by a, one of the accidents on the freeway and. Um, he saw it on Friday, and he certainly was shaken on Sunday, still. Um, whereas there was thousands of other people that drove by that accident that were unlikely to have been shaken by that accident. They just kept going. Mm -hmm. um, it is different for everyone. Uh, I would hate to, well, I won't make a joke about it, because it is a very serious thing. Our, our soldiers coming back from the war Two of them on the same patrol witness the same thing. One, his, his or her life is totally destroyed for a long, long time. And the other one just keeps moving on and comes back home, loves his wife and child or husband and children and gets a job. How, no one knows. The mind is a very strange thing. This is a, as it was explained to me, and, and it's kind of one of the, probably one of the bigger disappointments in the PTSD, it's very narrow. I wish it would have been broader. Um, and maybe the council can work on that over the next couple of years because I think we're going to have, uh, we have many, many veterans coming back and we're going to find jobs for them, that those that don't have it. And we need to be aware of it. It's going to be something coming forward. Uh, uh, so I hope the council takes that to heart and over this next year and actually maybe includes that. But I don't think it's included in this study. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and for the Deputy Commissioner, um, you reference uh, under Section 1 at the very tail end of that uh, uh, section, the uh, Manual of Mental Disorders published by the American Psychiatric Association. And in, in my uh, normative um, day job, we always talk about as amended or as updated in terms of pursuant to additional changes to uh, a manual or to a uh, clarifying issue, and I'm just wondering if if this um, definition uh, speaks to just that manual, or is it going to be speaking to that manual as it's amended? Commissioner Ryan. Mr. Chair, uh, members, it would speak to the most recently published manual. So to the extent that definitions or terms change and the manuals republished 
this section would refer to the most recent version. Jim Balbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My final question then, so would it be fair to say that in light of that answer um, and in terms of the, the chair's uh, recognition, the expansion uh, of the uh, definition is very likely with regard to PTSD? Commissioner Ryder. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that medical definitions do not change very frequently. Um, I can't speak specifically to the definition of PTSD, but I do know as a general matter, those definitions don't flip-flop and change very frequently. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Norton. Um, I wanted some clarification on um, something Representative Mahoney said and uh, with regard to the uh, PTSD. And it's my understanding that the language in the bill currently only addresses incidents that happen at the workplace, not incidents that people come to the workplace with. Is the <clears throat> excuse me, is the example you gave with our vets coming home who do often suffer from PTSD. So can you just clarify for me exactly what we're talking about? We're not talking about someone who might be suffering from PTSD from their involvement in the military who come to a job and are unable to function. It is someone who actually suffers PTSD as a result of their employment at the job currently. And I'm just looking for clarification. Commissioner Item. Mr. Chair, representatives, that's correct. We are only talking about PTSD arising out of and in the course of employment. Thank you. And then I do have an amendment when you're ready for that. So, are you, uh, yeah, let me go to Representative Savick here. Oh, thank you, quick. Chair. Um, I have a one question on Section 9 uh, 1 uh, Job Development Services. It's my understanding that they used to cover 52 weeks of job development services and with this bill, you have um, reduced this to 26 weeks, and I was wondering why, um, why that was reduced, and, and uh, what's your uh, reasoning behind that? Commissioner Item. Mr. Chair, members, um, again, this was part of a negotiated package, and how the specific limitation of three months and six months was determined, I can't speak to. But I mentioned that uh, after this provision was approved by the council, we did look at our internal records and we looked at them to see where our experience would show most cases fall in terms of the hour limit and the monthly limit. And the majority of our cases fell within four to six months that placement services would be terminated. So uh, again, I can't give you any specifics why six months was the magical limit, but I can tell you that our experience is the majority of cases fell below that limit. Representative Mahoney. Uh, Representative Slack, uh, the, the people who negotiated that agreement are coming to the witness table and that might be a question for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Isaacson, do you have a question? I'm going to save it for the folks coming to the table. <laughs> Very good. And uh, we're, uh, I think we're at a point for uh, Representative Mahoney. We'll, uh, we'll uh, take uh, Representative Norton's amendment here. No, Mr. Chair, no. why, don't we, why don't we bring up the, I'm sorry. Uh, the negotiators? Or All right, let's do that first. And, um, if we can hold off for a little bit, Representative Norton here, we're going to listen to some testimony. So, Shar Knutson and uh, Laura Bordelone, you'd uh, have a seat and uh, introduce yourselves for the record and please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you for letting us be here. 
My name is Cher Knudsen and I am president of the Minnesota AFL-CIO, a federation of over a thousand union locals representing more than 300,000 working men and women across the state. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Minnesota's workers' compensation law was passed in 1913. And really, in simple terms, it said if a worker is hurt on the job, that worker will receive the care and the support that they need. In return, the company would not be sued. So as we see it, we fairly feel that there's two stakeholders in this, the injured workers and the company that they work for. Now in 1992, the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council was created by the state legislature as a permanent council to address and recommend legislation pertaining to workers' compensation. This was an attempt to remove the very divisive workers' compensation battles that had taken place at the state legislature off and on for those 10 years prior. And it was based on a similar council that had operated in Wisconsin for many years. So as you may or may not know, the WCAC, the workers' uh, consists of 12 voting members, six representing organized labor, and six representing Minnesota's business. Ten of those are appointed by the governor, the majority and minority leaders in the Senate, and by the speaker and minority leaders in the House of Representatives. The other two are presidents of the largest statewide Minnesota business organization and the largest organized labor association, i.e. the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and the Minnesota AFL-CIO and we are co-chairs in this, this uh, committee. The advisory council recommendations must be supported by a majority of both business and labor members in order to move forward. At the April 10th, 2013 meeting of the WCAC, the labor and business came together and agreed to, uh, to a, a, a proposal and it was passed unanimously. Now, we all would have preferred to get this agreement before you in, le legislation, in legislation in March, but it took a while for us to get all the I's dotted and the, uh, the T's crossed. And so it was a hard-fought negotiation, but it was a good process. After the compromise was passed by the WCAC on April 10th, business and labor members of the council were approached with, with, with concerns. And while the WCAC members did not agree with all the concerns that were expressed, they did decide to make minor modifications to the compromise. And the changes to the agreement have been vetted and approved by labor and business WCAC members as well as the Department of Labor Industry. And this was all at the end was via in-person uh, contact or telephone and email. I'm here to say today that 75 members of the Minnesota AFL-CIO's general board unanimously voted to support the labor and business WCAC agreement of April 16, 2013. We feel this is a good bill. Is it a perfect bill? No. But you know very intimately that it's hard to ever find that perfect bill. And this is the bill that has been agreed to by the WCAC. And it is the most comprehensive agreement that we have come together for in nearly 20 years. It's a fair agreement, too, that will improve the lives of injured workers and take serious steps to realize cost savings. We feel it is the right thing to do, the right thing to do for injured workers, for business, and for the workers' compensation system. So I respectfully ask your support for this legislation uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Mr. Please Chair and proceed. Members. Introduce yourself. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Laura Bordelon. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here today on behalf of David Olson, who is the co-chair for the Workforce Advisory Council. He apologizes and regrets he can't be here today because of illness. Uh, I'm here to not only offer our support for the uh, agreement, but also for the Workforce Advisory Council. The Chamber represents over 2,300 businesses in the state, including over 500,000 employees, as Ms. Knudsen mentioned. Uh, we are a member of the Council and co-chair of the Council. There are six other business members who are supportive of this agreement. Um, 
it, it's, it's incredibly important to maintain the Workforce Advisory Council process. We think the results of this process have, have served workers and business well over a period of almost 20 years or more than 20 years. We're supportive of the process. We think this result is indicative of uh, the, the process working well. We ask for your support for this agreement, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Portalon. Uh, question, uh, Representative Norton. Thank you, and I fully understand how difficult it is to negotiate contracts, having served on the school board for a long time. Uh, I, I know that once a, a, something is brought forward and voted on by the membership, it's difficult to make changes and it's a sensitive issue. But I do want to discuss the issue um, <coughs> about the QRC time. And I guess um, for for many, as we heard earlier, there's an average that the department looked at and said um, that average uh, is upheld with the language that's currently in the, the bill. Um, for some regions of the state, when business where business isn't quite as robust, it may take folks a little bit longer to find a job. So my question to you is, was that particular discussion, um, I'm not sure my amendment is the perfect solution. Um, it is a solution because it, we are going from a change from nothing to something. And um, I'm finding a middle between something plus a, a, a little bit of time uh, in my amendment. So I, I guess my question to you is, did you on the council have uh, a robust discussion about extending it um, as the amendment that we're going to talk about in a few minutes um, from 26 months to perhaps 52. Did you discuss that option? And if so, uh, and if not, that would be interesting to me. But if so, um, why did you, besides it was an average, why did you settle for 26 months for the QRC time um, to find placement, particularly given 26 to, weeks, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. it was a little different. Um, particularly given the difference between um, urban rural placements. Yeah. Mr. Chair and Representative Norton. Ms. Borland. Thank you. Uh, the, this idea stemmed from discussions from uh, Workforce Advisory Council meetings from the previous administration. This idea and the time had been discussed at that point. In terms of an average, I would have to defer to Ben Gerber on our staff, who is part of the constructing of, of the agreement, um, indicate if we were supportive of an average or not. But to your to your question, your point about support for the agreement, it was it was challenging to, to reach this compromise, and I think our sense is we'd prefer to see the agreement uh, uh, continue as presented to you. But in specific response to your to your question about the average, I'd have to defer to uh, Ben Gerber on our staff. Mr. Chair. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ben Gerber. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Chair, my name is Brad Leto, Chief of Staff for the Minnesota AFL CIO. Um, I yeah, if you want, I mean, I can address uh, the in in 2007 and, and eight, uh, mainly 2007. There was a um, workers' compensation vocational rehabilitation task force um, that was represented by four members of business, four members of labor, and four QRCs. Uh, they had a series of meetings throughout 2007. Um, votes were taken in public, and in fact, the labor folks voted down a number of proposals, um, uh, along with some QRCs, quite honestly, in in that uh, that uh, time frame. Um, there was discussion about the 20 uh, uh, 20 weeks a month, the six month discontinu uh, discontinuation of uh, job search. Um, no, which is defined a little more uh, strictly in here, um, or, or strictly rather than broadly. Um, and also the QRC, uh, not certain as disability case manager. The, that proposal was, um, and these, and, and was, was voted on um, in the task force in September of 2007. 
or 2000, uh, 2008, I believe, I'm sorry. And, um, let me check my notes, 2008, uh, and did pass unanimously of all the, there was a number of other provisions that passed as well. None of them um, ended up being implemented. They were forwarded to the work, Workers' Compensation Advisory Council members. The 20, um, 20 hours a month provision never got any, uh, uh, and, and to date, Personally, I've heard no um, negative, believe me, I've heard a lot of negative things as you have about the six month um, issue, but I've heard nothing about, that's not to say it's not out there, but I've heard nothing about the 20 hours a month um, limitation. Uh, the disability case manager issue, we did make a, a change to that after the agreement because as it was clarified that some people work otherwise outside of uh, rehabilitation in hospitals and other sorts of uh, situations with that position, and we didn't want to limit that. Um, the six month um, discontinuation, and I know it was mentioned about the rural areas. It's interesting in a number of, and by the way, and if there's any, if there's QRCs or, or, re, or job vendor people here that I didn't, that uh, didn't respond to, or that President Knudsen didn't, we responded to about two thirds of them, and I still haven't gotten my response to every one of them, so I apologize for that. Um, but the uh, the issue on, in the rural areas, we, we were told by a number of folks, job vendors, that in a rural areas of towns, 500 to 5,000 people, um, there are these types of jobs, and they would explain the types of jobs in those areas. And they'd say that the injured worker was either too disabled or needed job skills enhancement. And that's why they needed more job search. And to tell you the truth, it kind of that was one of the reasons we looked at it is like, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. We're not cutting off the rehab here, the rehabilitation. So if they need further rehabilitation, that's there. But if the, these are the jobs in the area, they're going to need either training or job skills enhancement or some sort to get those jobs in the area. Because insurance companies, quite honestly, won't pay for relocation to another area. Um, so that was kind of the dilemma that we're faced. Um, and, you know, that since it was the previous uh, provision that folks voted for, that was the discussion, and that's why it was six months. So, Representative Norton. Thank you. Uh, and just to follow up on that, you're talking about 2007 and 2008, and that's pre-recession. And I'm wondering if, there, if the recession has had any sort of uh, perhaps new influence on this that wasn't discussed, or have you vetted and thoroughly vetted this post-recession as well? Um, thank Glado. you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Norton. The, in, since 2000, I believe it's 2007, the workers' compensation system report of the Department of Labor and Industry has separated out job placement as far as a percentage of rehabilitation or job search and all of the activities. Not There are some additional ones that aren't covered in here. Um, and in 2007 or, or 8, I can't remember, 2007, 8, I think 8, no, 7, 8, and 9 when they started it was 25% of the re, of all of re, vocational rehabilitation, 25% of it was job search placement, all of those activities that some are included here and some not. In 2010, the last year of the, um, that they've looked at, because uh, there's always a couple years leg, um, to, uh, so it was done in 2011, so for 2010, 27% of, so in other words, 25% was done for three years, and in 2010 that went to 27% of the total rehab costs. So there was a two, I mean, in essence, there was a 2% difference. Um, but those were, you know, and so now we'd have to look at next year, 2011, to see if that's changed. But it's always been around a quarter. Uh, and this won't discontinue all of that, by the way, that 27 or 25%. So, but anyways, that's, we did look at that. Yes. Uh, Representative Isaacson, are you done, Representative Norton? Yeah, Representative Isaacson. Uh, earlier it was stated that um, most services stop between four and six months 
RQRC, and did they stop because a job was found? Or why was that studied or understood why the services stopped? Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Isaacson, uh, the department could, and I do have those reports here that I could look at, but for my, for my recollection that people going back to the current, their current or former position or a new job, uh, six months, uh, that's, a, that's uh, I mean, I think that's a very good um, percentage that go back to work at a, like, and close to their pre-injury wage. Uh, it drops after that, you know, nine months, it's not too bad. If you're out a year, and the department could look, you know, more specifically at this, but if you're out a year or longer, that percentage drops, and the, and the, the number, the percent of pre-injury wage that is received uh, drops as well. Um, uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Chair, <laughs> Representative Isaacson, uh, usually I don't like to speak for people in the audience, but uh, Commissioner Peterson did decisively shake his head when you m mentioned that uh, it, it, it was that they found a job. Um, so in the interest of time, it, it, you know, I feel comfortable that that, that four to six months was um, because they found a job why the benefits stopped. All right, thank you. Representative Albright. Uh, the question I have is actually probably for the previous testifiers. I don't know if I'm taking it out of sequence, Mr. Chair. apologize if that's the case. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the testifiers, um, in the conversation and the discussion, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, labor and, and, and business have, have come to the table. And I just want to circle back to the comments I made earlier about the, 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 the issues with regard to the public sector, um, particularly firefighters. Um, uh, those in the public sector that have to deal with em emotionally charged situations. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you can speak to whether or not those um, employees that are in our, our counties uh, dealing with um, those situations, are were their voices represented and, and considered in, in terms of this, um, this arrangement? Just a moment. I, I believe I know the answer. Okay. Ms. Knuth. Um, thank you. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, in some cases, they are covered under other legislation. The traumatic aspect of it could be under workers' comp. That's what I am understanding. Representative Albright. Uh, that, that's an answer. I don't know that it's the, the full-fledged answer. I'm just wondering if you can belabor the point and expand on your answer a little more and just give me some understanding in terms of where it would be covered or who who's going to pick up uh, the cost for this in terms of the agreement because we've got um, a lot of instances where you're, you're lifting patients, you're um, dealing with um, uh, charge situations that uh, if they got out of hand, now you've got a, a situation where um, the lingering effects affect that, uh, you know, assert themselves on that person, maybe not initially, but in later times. So I'm, I'm just I'm very concerned about from the standpoint of uh, I'm not wanting to, you know, slight, you know, the private sector, but the public sector in this this point, I'm just wondering, I wanted to verify that they are being served as well uh, by this um, legislation as the public's, uh, private sector would. Um, Ms. Knudsen or uh, Commissioner Item? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, with regard to the current law, it's my understanding that police officers are covered for PTSD in some very narrow situations. I believe that the police officer would have to cause the death or serious injury to another person. And under those circumstances, 
the police officer is entitled to wages and certain other benefits for a year. So I think that situation is very narrow and uh, would have to be coordinated with the new position, or the new provision if it passes. But there are two different sorts of things that would be covered and the benefits are different. So there would just have to be some coordination. We have Jim Albright. I'm gonna, I hope I don't open up a Pandora's box by this question. Um, I've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you, I'm gonna paint you a scenario. Um, I, I, I believe very strongly in um, uh, hiring uh, those that have served our country. In the in light of that, most of them are coming back to um, a job in, uh, let's just say for the sake of um, argument, law enforcement, in uh, triage, in uh, helping others that are in need, in the ambulatory circumstances, what have you. But they are coming back from circumstances where they have already experienced the devastation of an experience that you know we can only uh, imagine, and for them to deal with that on on their terms, and I know that they get help. My question goes to now they're in another circumstance, another situation, where they may experience similar circumstances, which could trigger uh, an episode or a response to a PTSD. So my question goes to. Is there a, a, a means of identifying a pre-existing condition or uh, from a psychological evaluation to determine where that PTSD actually started? Or in this, is this a triggering mechanism? So how, where, where's, where's the, the bright line? And I apologize that you probably don't have as succinct an answer as I'm looking for, but I'm, I'm hoping for the sake of the committee that you can elaborate on that. Commissioner Item. Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, I can't give you a bright line, but I can tell you that even with physical injuries, you will oftentimes have individuals that had a pre existing injury, and then that injury is either flares up or it's exacerbated by the new job. And there are professionals, uh, medical professional, professionals, who determine what caused the current problem. Was it that old situation or is it something new? And I suspect that that's what would occur with the PTSD as well, that there will have to be some determination if you've got an individual who has had PTSD, has been diagnosed with that, and then comes into the workplace and suffers another traumatic event. There would have to be some medical professional who would have to opine on what caused the latest injury. It will have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, I have another question on the QRC. Um, as testified before, most of your requirements for this are met within the 26 weeks. Most people get a job by that, and, and just a minority of them go past the 26 weeks. I was wondering then if most of the money is spent in the first 26 weeks, it wouldn't cost that much to increase this to 52 weeks. Am I right or wrong in that assessment? And the other question is, by not increasing it to 52 weeks, you're cutting off the most needy people because there's people out there that would really need the full 52 weeks to get another job. Mr. Gerber. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Savick, thank you. The, uh, one of the things that we talked about with the department, uh, along with labor and within our, the chamber's own robust discussion about this policy, and um, you know, like as uh, uh, Brad mentioned, you know, we worked off an existing uh, document and conversation that occurred under um, the, the preceding administration. One of the things that we discussed is that. Um, in that six-month window, we think it's important and, and we're hopeful that part of the rehabilitation um, and job search effort will be in teaching somebody how to look for a job. You know, we understand that um, that in the last 10 years, and even since I've entered the workforce, that, you know, the, the, the job search has changed dramatically, but part of 
that we believe that moving forward, the, the, the process will include teaching someone how to look for a job. So when the, the six months end, and we're hopeful, based on some of the data you've heard, that we won't need to go past, the, that, that nobody will go past the six months, that they will then be able to find their own job and they'll have those skills. Representative Savick. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Any, uh, any other questions at this time? Okay, so we're going to keep moving down the list here. Uh, I have uh, Steve Hollander. And, uh, and, uh, and John Weddle, if you want to come up. Uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Mahoney. I, I believe uh, these particular witnesses are uh, have an issue with the QRC. And Representative Norton's uh, amendment deals specifically with the QRC. So this might be an appropriate time to, for Representative Norton to offer her amendment. If uh, that... Uh... <laughs> Sounds like a good recommendation. Representative Norton, would you like to proceed with your amendment? Certainly, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Mahoney. Um, I, I know there's agreement, and as we've talked about, I'm not certain this particular bill will, our amendment, if it was put on the bill, would completely um, upset the agreement. It didn't sound like it was that traumatic of an issue, but I am going to um, ask that we move the A2 amendment for possible consideration, and what it does is extend um, the the six month time um, for the QRCs that we talked about. Um, and it, it's uh, the A2, it's on, the changes are on page nine. And if it's acceptable, we have some folks who would like to, to speak to that amendment uh, and the need for it. And we'll just let them give details, I think. We have the amendment before us. So let's uh, get some uh, discussion on that. And uh, a couple of testifiers. and I. I believe these are the gentlemen that I, Mr. Hollander and Mr. Wedel, if that's yes, correct, that's please correct. Uh, um, introduce yourself into the record and uh, and uh, if you have some testimony, then we're going to have some questions, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, my name is Steve Hollander. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank you for allowing uh, Mr. Wedel and I to testify today. Um, uh, I promise that my comments will be brief. Uh, I'm a QRC. Mr. Wadle is a, a placement specialist or place, uh, placement person, so he'll, he'll be talking more about the, the challenges of, of job placement with injured workers. Um, I want to mention that I'm a QRC, and I've been a, a QRC for 32 years. Um, uh, during that, that, um, that time, I've worked with uh, thousands of injured workers. Um, my job is to help injured workers get back to work in suitable employment as fast as possible. Um, I'm all, as in, as in addition to my work as a QRC, I'm also involved as the um, uh, legislative chairperson for our professional association, the Minnesota Association of Rehabilitation Providers. Uh, I've been uh, uh, the chair for uh, 19 years. I've also been a 16-year member of the Rehabilitation Review Panel. Um, I'm here to address concerns about the job development limitation that there's, there's already been some discussion about. Um, I, I first want to say uh, one thing very clearly, uh, that we, members of MARP, uh, the QRC and, and job placement community, have great respect for the work, Workers' Comp Advisory Council and the work that they do. We have no intention and do not want to upend the Workers' Comp <coughs> Advisory Council process. However, this time, on this particular issue, they simply got it wrong. <coughs> Three months of job development services for the six-month limit is simply not enough time to help injured workers return to work in new jobs. These people face many challenges and obstacles beyond the challenges faced by the, an able-bodied job seeker. We find that it normally takes longer than six months for injured workers to find new suitable employment. I heard discussion this morning already about a study that was done by the department 
Um, I'm not aware of this study about uh, allegedly that workers get back to work within six months. I don't know what it says. I don't know uh, who did it. I don't know what workers they, they study. I'm a member of the Rehab Review Panel, and I've never heard of this before, so I'd be curious to hear more about it. Um, we find that it takes longer than six months, on average, to get people back to work in new jobs. The, this proposal um, that's on the table today has not really been studied or vetted, in, in my, to my knowledge, uh, and we believe that's, that's wrong. Um, we, we acknowledge that sometimes job placement services go on too long. We agree that there can be limits on job development services for injured workers. What we are looking at is to make a small change, a change to, to, uh, to a three-month stop and then a six-month total limit on, uh, I mean, a six-month stop and a hard limit of 12 months as opposed to a three-month stop and a six-month limit. We believe that this would allow workers the help they need to get back to the workforce. Vocational rehabilitation costs and workers' compensation are low, roughly 3% of the total. Job placement, job development services are about 1% of the total. Cutting off these services at six months will produce little cost savings, but potentially some great harm. We also believe that this proposal may actually increase costs rather than reduce costs. Injured workers left without sufficient help will give up job, uh, job search not return to work, and likely do things like file for permanent total disability, or social security disability income, or some other taxpayer government program for, for a subsistence. Workers' Comp Advisory Council process is important. Making this change will not harm that process. We are asking you to help us help injured workers get back to work. Please, please change the job development restriction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hollander. Uh, Mr. Weddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representatives. Uh, my name is John Weddle, and I own a job placement services company in, uh, for the, in, that we vendor uh, to injured workers in the Minnesota work comp system. Currently in the Minnesota work comp system, um, uh, placement services are provided to injured workers who have been injured on the job. Their doctors have said that they are now released uh, to go back to work with certain physical limitations and usually in a situation where uh, the employers, as a result of their limitations, do not have uh, work for them anymore. So basically they've been hurt. The doctor said you can go back with certain limitations, but the employer can't re-employ them. Uh, that happens many, many times where these, uh, these folks have been using the, their backs and their muscles and, and their bodies to make very good careers for themselves. They've been injured and, uh, and as a result uh, are forced to not simply look for a new job but to look for an entirely new career because they can't do what they've always done as evidence that they're a good candidate for their next job. As a placement specialist, uh, what we do is we perform it and teach very proactive job search techniques, strategic job search techniques to these injured, injured workers. And uh, uh, the, the most valuable of these services are these job development services that this legislation is looking to reduce greatly uh, down to six months. Uh, these services provide things like making cold calls to employers, writing uh, cover letters, you know, not to human resources or to whom it may concern, but doing the digging, find the actual hiring managers, and selling these candidates to employers, um, and, uh, and essentially uh, using our professional networks. I've been in the employment industry for over 20 years, so using our personal contacts to get uh, folks interviews and get hired. Uh, you know, a good example of this is we recently uh, placed a, a, a diesel truck mechanic into a job at, um, at GE Capital Fleet Services in Eden Prairie as a telephonic service technician. Uh, we, got, uh, we, we found this job through cold calling techniques and we found uh, the actual hiring manager through our own contacts. He was then uh, uh, given an interview and was hired. This job was not posted and uh, it, you know, it took us about eight months to do this. Uh, this gentleman was looking for, for gas station attendant jobs prior to our work because he, he didn't have a clue he could actually do a job like that. Okay. Um, 
uh, just quick stats from uh, CIO Magazine and AOL.com generally put the average average work uh, return, average job search time currently as uh, seven to 12 months to return to work in, in a job search in the economy today. Uh, that's for able-bodied folks that some have education, some can utilize their background of the things that they've done their whole career to find their next jobs. Injured workers don't have that, uh, that, that, that ability. Uh, this legislation, again, is looking to stop job search, are, are providing a job search assistance at six months. Um, it, it takes a long, it, it, oftentimes it can take longer than that. Minnesota is very, very good at this. Our return to work rates are, are close to top in the country in terms of our speed of returning injured workers back to work. Cutting this up at six months is going to greatly uh, affect those rates. Um, just just to, to close, um, uh, like Steve said, I, I fear that people will go on uh, permanent total disability, uh, uh, unemployment, and, and other taxpayer employment paid uh, resources uh, to, to make it through if we get cut off at six months. So I ask please to extend this to 12 months. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Keeper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of comments. Um, you know, if it's not enough time, there's other options too. There's workforce development programs. Um, wondered if you donate your own time to extend if there's a couple of cases. Uh, we're here to make tough decisions and doubling the allowance that the agreement came from the council is not, is not a small change, it's doubling. And um, I always say follow the money. I mean, there's some economic interest and in, in, in I understand your position and why this would be important for your business. Um, but we need to at least try this. I know that the work count council meets all the time, you know, all year long. If this becomes a huge problem, the department will let us know. And if we need to make a small change next year, I'm, sur I'm sure we could look into that. Um, I think we need to respect the process uh, there's been a lot of work going into this, and this is an agreement. And when we have, you know, some wins and some some wins for business, some wins for labor, but the main goal is to get people back to work. That's what we all agree on. And I don't think it would be the intention to not do that. And I don't think this provision is. I don't. I think if it was going to really, really hurt getting these folks back to work, it wouldn't be in here. I don't think that would have been an agreement. So I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to support this amendment and I'd ask people to uh, vote no on it. Thank you. Representative Gunther. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also am not gonna support this amendment because even though I know the QRCs do good work and they get a lot of people back to work quickly, they're bragging all the time we do it quickly. Well, quickly is less than six months to me. The statistics prove that six months or less is the time that's necessary to get people to work. And uh, for that reason, I'm also going to oppose this amendment. Representative Hugel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too will oppose the amendment. Um, you know, the job development services is just that. Uh, I don't believe it's, it's intended to be a full-time employment agency uh, for all this. I think, and I, I've gone through some of this a little bit in my uh, previous life, um, the, the counseling that goes on, uh, many of these people have never, uh, they've worked the same job for many, many years and, and they get injured on the job and, and that's a tragedy. And they probably haven't been filling out a lot of resumes lately, haven't been putting together their resume, probably haven't gone to a job interview for many years, um, and, and all of that. So they have to learn that, and I, I respect that, and I think that 26 weeks teaching somebody the ropes about being out there in the unemployed is a very, very good thing. But after, after they've had all of this counseling and all of the uh, learning how to make cold calls on employee, employers, learning how to put together a resume, learning the ropes on the, today's world with computers and things like that, um, if it takes seven to 12 months to get a job, that's regrettable. We have to remember the economy is getting better and, and in many cases 
uh, that window is, is, is closing down. But the job development services teaches these poor workers what to do in the modern world. And then after that, they're on their own and they can do it. I really believe that. So I think the window is, uh, uh, with up to 26 weeks, is pretty good and therefore I would oppose the amendment also. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Norton. Well, apparently there's a lot of consternation behind the scenes on this one. Um, I guess I would like to uh, question Mr. Gunther's assertion and perhaps the departments as well, as well that there is research showing this because what we're hearing is two very different um, and I don't have any of it in front of me. So I guess I would ask before we vote on this, Mr. Chair, that we ask both parties to bring forward their research that shows whether it needs to be done before six months or if the average is before six months or if it really does take closer to a year. Because you're asking me to make a decision on something my gut is telling me. I don't want people on federal disability. I see it. I get calls all the time. I know people on federal disability who shouldn't be on it. And I'm shocked, frankly, that some doctor wrote a note, and I hate to say that uh, to my, in a, because I live in a medical community, but I know people that are on federal disability and we're paying for their entire livelihood for something I think they're, they very easily can and should be working. I know them. Um, so I guess, you know, if, if changing this to extend it a little bit keeps those people off federal disability, keeps them off state programs, I want to give them that extra time, but I'm not seeing anything in writing. I'm hearing two different sides of the story. I'm hearing one saying it'll take less than six months or the average is six months. I'm hearing another saying it takes closer to seven or 12. I'm also hearing that Minnesota has really great rates and, and we do a good job as a state, which I think is super. And for the few people that this would apply to by extending it from six months to 12 months is going to keep them off state programs and federal disability. I'd like to offer that as a, you know, to me, this is a, um, a compromise between what is it currently in the bill as a proposal and nothing, which is what we had before. Um, so putting a 12 month and a six month in there is, is still a limitation we didn't have before. So I guess, uh, Mr. Chair, is there not a way we can um, put this, lay this on the table and come back with some data? Because if I can see the data that tells me it's only six months, I might withdraw my amendment. But I don't have that in front of me. I'm being asked to just trust me with two different people that are giving two different ideas and, and, and I'm very uncomfortable with making the decision. So I guess I, I would make a motion that we lay the bill on the table uh, until we can have that information provided us and then if, if it shows that I'm wrong, I'll withdraw my amendment, Mr. Chair. We've got an, an unclear to me on the procedure here. We've got an amendment in front of us. Um, I made a motion you, to lay the, the you, bill on the table until we can get the information. Could, would you withdraw Mr. your amendment first? Is that the correct? I don't know Mr. that I need Chair, to. Uh, I don't think she asked to okay. withdraw her amendment it hasn't been at voted. this particular time because it hasn't been voted on. And I, I don't have the in front of me. I don't know which is the higher motion. Yeah. So the question is... Which is the higher motion, lay on the table, table or the amendment? Tabling the amendment. Okay. So the lay on the table is the higher motion. Set and move. If I might add a few words to it. Please, Representative Mahoney. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Norton, I would oppose. Uh, I will just say I oppose that amendment for a motion. We've heard a uh, uh, motion before us to lay the bill on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Motion did not prevail. Um, okay, so we're back to your amendment, Representative Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I'm going to leave my amendment on here because I think, and I want a roll call because we're voting on something without information and apparently everybody's quite comfortable with that but me. So I would like to be on record that I'm not comfortable voting for something when the author and the, the folks on both sides will not provide me with the data showing which side is correct on this. So um, with that, um, I'll quit talking. Representative Mahoney. Certainly everyone has uh, uh, a to vote the way they prefer, but I would, uh, I will tell people that this particular uh, 
bill, if it is amended, will be vetoed. It will be vetoed and it will be going away. This has substantial savings for uh, the business community, substantial bu uh, benefit increases for um, injured workers. Uh, it has uh, the first time this state has ever addressed the idea of post-traumatic stress. Are there winners and are there losers in this bill? Yes. Um, we certainly could come up with that information. As I understand it, those studies are there from 2007 and 2008 and 2009, according to the testimony. Um, that was not brought forth at this particular time, but I would ask that uh, on this roll call uh, that you vote no. Vote no on this, on, on this particular amendment because there are too many good things in this bill for this to fall apart and not uh, address the concerns of injured workers, the business community, um, the uh, mentally uh, injured workers, uh, the uh, hospital and medical communities that have very strong concerns mm -hmm. and have an opportunity to actually drag both sides into the mm -hmm. 21st century. Members, right now, some of this stuff is, some of the uh, billing is done by hard copy, as I understand it. And this study will determine, has a good chance of um, uh, prompt payment from insurance companies, rather than uh, appealing and waiting six or nine or 12 months. There are many good things. There are, there are some things that I'm, not, I'm a bit uncomfortable. I recognize the fact that Representative Norton and the QRCs have a valid concern. And I think that message has been sent to the Work Comp Advisory Committee. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm going to be kind and say that the Work Comp Council sometimes gets a little um, thick skulled and doesn't hear what people are trying to tell them. Maybe this will be a, uh, an enlightening moment. But at this particular time, I would ask that uh, you vote against this amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to withdraw my roll call, but I would like a voice vote, please. Very good. Uh, the roll call has been withdrawn. Uh, Representative Metz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to speak on behalf of this. I think Representative Norton brings up a good point. but. Uh, saying that, I do think that a lot of work went into putting this together to get it in the shape it's in, and we could all bring a lot of good points to the table, and I thank you for doing so and having a discussion with us. Uh, and I would love to see more information as well, as I'm sure the rest of the committee would, but I think, uh, you know, today I would like to see our committee uh, vote this out, get it signed by the governor, and, uh, you know, start the good work that the people at the table, or finish the good work that the people at the table started. So. Uh, I would encourage you all to vote yes, or no to Norton's amendment, but yes to the bill. <laughs> I'm go. sorry, I haven't had my coffee yet. We have we have construction in Mahoney's district. district so. Somebody uh, get Representative Metz with some coffee, please, uh, Representative Baby. And if I knew it was that easy, I'd be using the mics way more. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to uh, Representative Norton and everybody else, I appreciate uh, the concern that you brought forward. I really do. Uh, I do want to point out in the bill, you know, in the amendment, the uh, A130534, which is the study, you know, first of all, um, they're, they're due to report back uh, by the end of December. Uh, if you take a look at, at the bill itself, the effective date of the bill is October 1st. Um, you know, we've got a three-month window there where maybe some of these concerns can be brought forward to the work group. And, uh, you know, if, if it is evident that uh, an adjustment needs to be made, I think it can be made early in the next legislative session. And, uh, you know, we can, we can make an addition. I'm not going to say fix it necessarily, but we can make an addition or a change in the, in the language that, uh, that we need. I would encourage uh, a no vote on the uh, Norton Amendment and a yes on the bill. Thanks for all the hard work. I had some concerns about the bill, as Representative Mahoney knows, and other people. And uh, I appreciate the fact that those have also been addressed. Thank you. Representative Isaacson. 
Uh, I share some of the sentiments recently stated, uh, and I do have definite concerns with where we're at on the 20 hours, but uh, I have to say that the good far outweighs the bad in the situation. And for me, um, you know, I think we need, as Representative Fabian said, to revisit this down the road and keep this on our radar screen. But um, there's too much other things that have gone on in this bill that I think parties are happy with to see uh, that part cause it to stall out either by vetoing or the deal is falling apart and causing us to delay passing uh, with some important legislation. So uh, I will be a no vote. Okay. We have, uh, I have no further uh, speakers on the list here that are uh, questions. So we're uh, brought to the uh, vote on the uh, H1359 A2 amendment. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. 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 Amendment does not prevail. The motion does not prevail. Amendment is not adopted. Now we go to uh, more testimony here at, uh, at Jim Thank you. Leroy. Chair, members, uh, my name is Jim Leroy. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Self-Insured Group, Inc. We are an advocacy group for workers' compensation group self-insureds. And I want to speak on just two quick points on the uh, proposed amendment to uh, Minnesota Statute 176.011, Subdivision 15 and 16, which is the post-traumatic stress disorder and mental impairment. Uh, from the standpoint of the... Uh, uh, the members of the uh, uh, Self-Insured Group Association. Post-traumatic stress disorder uh, being included now as a, a compensable disease and being included under the occupational disease section in addition to being under the personal injury section of the statute creates a, a financial uncertainty for the self-insured. It's a very significant one. And that uncertainty is that <laughs> Occupational diseases for purposes of reinsurance under the state mandated WCRA program is handled differently for occupational disease than it is for personal injury. Personal injury where you have multiple people injured in a single occurrence, there is one uh, retention, one deductible if you will, that is uh, uh, re responsible and paid for by the uh, self-insured group. In an occupational disease setting, there is a separate deductible for every injured person. The uh, clear language in uh, uh, the WCRA statute, the enabling statute 7934, establishes for occupational diseases after October 1st, 1979, that it is to be applied that way. And the clear language of the reinsurance agreement, which is entered into by every insurer and every self-insured in the state of Minnesota, also provides that occupational disease claims are potentially handled in that method. Uh, the difference, for example, if uh, you know, take a uh, bank robbery with hostages and 10 people are traumatized by that and are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress dis disorder, none of them injured but traumatized by being held hostage and uh, maybe having guns pointed at them. The difference is if that was personal injury alone, that's a $470,000 maximum exposure for a self-insured or a self-insured group. If it's termed an occupational disease, that's a $4.7 million out-of-pocket exposure for a self-insured group. So on behalf of the self-insured groups, what I would be asking is that as you consider the passage through of this bill, that you consider taking the definition of mental impairment and the related language out of the occupational disease section and leaving it in the personal injury section so it remains a covered and compensable uh, injury. But until we can get clarification and perhaps get an adjustment made so that the financial impact uh, on the self-insured employers is reduced or made more certain that, uh, that it can be addressed. The second item, Mr. Chairman and members, is the, is the language in the bill which has to do with 
carving out the exception that it is not intended that post-traumatic stress disorders triggered in the ordinary course of employer-employee relations uh, don't qualify as a compensable event. And uh, we certainly agree with that. However, there are three words in there that, that, that cause us pause, and that is the language that exempts or requires that there could be a compensable claim if the actions taken by the employer were determined uh, not to be in good faith. Uh, the workers' compensation since its inception, I think you heard earlier, a uh, hundred years ago, is a no-fault system. The, the addition of language of a finding of in good faith creates a liability determination that has to be made prior to something being determined compensable. Uh, Minnesota already has a myriad of remedies for employees who are aggrieved by how their employers treat them in a discriminatory setting or in a hostile work environment setting uh, through collective bargaining agreements. We don't need to create a litigated is it or is it not compensable uh, situation for post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I, on, again, on behalf of the uh, Minnesota Self-Insured Group's uh, 1,200 employers and 30,000 employees, we would ask that you consider deleting the words in good faith from that section of the uh, proposed statutory amendment. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Leroy. Uh, questions here, uh, Representative Keeper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the testifier, did you testify in committee in the work comp council? I don't remember hearing you, but just want to check. <laughs> no, I'm not on the work comp, work comp advisory council. On it, but Representative Kiefer. I mean, we have lots of people come in and testify with issues that are of concern. So I just wondered, and you said no, so that's fine. That answers my oh, question. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, Mr. Uh, we were represented at the committee meetings by Shep Harris, who raised all of these issues on our behalf. And I was on the uh, most recent uh, telephone conference call as a muted listener. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, just, uh, again, I don't think we should play around with this bill anymore. It's not really what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, the council has done its job. I do think this is a work in process. It'll keep us busy next year in the council. Um, you know, if there's some, some serious concerns, there's problems that's showing up, I am convinced that the department will come to us and we will be able to fix these. So I would... I would just like to, to continue moving this this bill forward right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank yes, you. thank you, Mr. Leroy. And uh, Mark Rogers, uh, come down for testimony, please. Welcome, Mr. Rogers, and introduce yourself for the record, and glad you made the trip. Sure. Mark Rogers. I'm an attorney from Bemidji, Minnesota, and I represented <clears throat> the uh, unfortunate, very unfortunate situation in Red Lake uh, where I represented the teachers and the security guards that were involved. And there really isn't a good solution right now for people who have post-traumatic stress disorder in the state. We have a <clears throat> current decision where the trial judge uh, denied relief to someone who had post-traumatic stress disorder. So this legislation is sorely needed to clarify uh, the law in the state of Minnesota. You're not, it's a compromise bill as we've all talked about. Um, the trial lawyers would have liked to have a lot broader language. This is not a broad language bill. It's going to cover those who are most deserving, who have severe mental disability and who are disabled. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Mahoney. Mr. Chair, if I could make some closing remarks. We're pretty close to the end of our committee, and unless there's other questions. I, I, I've got a couple more testifiers here, Representative Mahoney, it appears so. Um, but you proceed as you, no, as you wish. Questions, I, go right ahead, I, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, uh, any questions? Oh, President Norton. I want to make a formal request because I know what happens often when bills pass, and that is the concerns that are raised are, are dropped. 
And so I'm making a formal request, both of the council and the folks from the QRC that testified on, on the amendment that I had for them. I want, I want to see the data. And I think members of this committee deserve to see the data from both sides. Um, because, the, you know, this, I know this is a really <clears throat> difficult bill, Representative Mahoney, and I apologize for causing you grief um, <laughs> today. Uh, but You're so alone with that. My, my today, just today. Colleagues. I do it all the time. Um, <laughs> You know, we're, we're, we're being asked to, to honor an agreement, but the fact is this bill has been uh, renegotiated in the last week or two and some, but not all, of the issues were addressed. And I know two of the big ones were addressed. There are still two remaining issues that were not addressed. So while we're being asked to honor the agreement, the agreement has been in flux. Um, I'm a little frustrated that we didn't get all four of these agreements hammered out because I think we could have. I, I don't think they were insurmountable. Um, I understand, um, you know, now people just want it to be done. But I, I do need to see the data. Our job is not just to vote for something because someone else has agreed to it. My job, or at least I believe it is, is to get the data and make my decision based on the data. So um, I'm going to vote to get this out of committee today, but I do expect shortly, in short order, to get this. Because if the data is, if, if we're not being given true data, then you know I need to know that, and I and, and I can make my objections um, at a later time, or ask as uh, Representative Kiefer has suggested that, and some of the others that, that this isn't the end of the road. That there's always next year, uh, and there is, and this institution forever is uh, tinkering with things we do this year, next year, um, and I and and depending on what data is brought before me and what I see, I may be one of the ones. Um, moving forward with some of that tinkering. But, uh, and I hope I get some support from folks around the table if I, if I do that and if they see the same thing that they might see. And thank you, and again, I apologize. I know this was difficult, and, and I thank you, Representative Mahoney, for taking it on. Your uh, comments have been duly noted in the record, Representative Norton. Did you have a comment at this time, Representative Mahoney? Or? Just it's always nice to get another convert to get rid of the Workers' Comp Advisory Council. <laughs> That's duly noted in the record as well, Representative Mahoney. <laughs> uh, we have a, a uh, Susan Lauer to testify today. Ma'am? Ma'am? Right. So, introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed. My name is Susan Lauer. I'm here as a citizen. I am not a rehab provider. I am not an injured worker. I have no vested interest in the outcome personally. I don't stand to gain or lose from this bill. However, I have serious concerns about the impact of this bill on injured workers. I want to lay out why. There's been discussion about this provision of limiting job placement, job development services. You all took a vote before I had an opportunity to talk about it, but the existing vocational services are not an outrageous benefit. They are designed to get injured workers back to work. That's the extent of it. That's the goal, to restore their economic status to that they would have enjoyed without disability. Not a huge, preposterous benefit. This time limit will impact the people who are most seriously injured. We know that they have permanent injuries that preclude them from doing their date of injury job or occupation. That's why they qualify for these services. 80% of those individuals who have a permanent partial disability rating, over 20% are among those people getting these services. They have, a per they have permanent restrictions that preclude them from their date of injury job and they have permanent functional loss. We know that 95% of injured workers who are getting more than 12 months of temp total are getting uh, rehab services. We know these people aren't back to work within 12 months. That's just not how it happens. There is no report that will show that injured workers who are unable to go back to work with their date of injury employment get back to work in three months. There isn't such a study. There is no information that will show that. Um, it, because it doesn't happen. That's not what happens. Re job search by individuals who are unable to do their date of injury job and have been terminated by their employers take an extended time to get those jobs. Why is that? Well, be 
because they can't do the job they had at date of injury and they don't they often don't have transferable skills they are have worked in this job they lose the job they are may have limited educational backgrounds and they are out in a competitive labor market where they don't compete easily we know people without disabilities that have taken a year or longer to get new jobs when they are laid off we know that it is more difficult for an injured worker who's precluded from doing their date of injury occupation to get a job what can make the difference everyone agrees that job seeking skills is an important component of rehab I want you to be aware that there is no current time limit for job development there isn't such a thing as a 52 week time limit for those services there isn't a time limit because the goal of rehab is to get people back to work so you're imposing an arbitrary time limit for those people that are having the most difficulty getting jobs and it's a time limit on those services where someone is going to contact employers try to generate job leads try to help people get co employer contacts it's beyond those services that these people find useful in getting a job no one has an interest in get, doing something other than getting these people back to work so putting an arbitrary limit on this undermines the core purpose of vocational rehab we know that rehab services are effective we know that because if you look at the Department of Labor publication it says that in 2010 where there were 5130 uh, rehab plan closures um, where the plan goes to completion there was a 98 percent return to work rate. <laughs> great news when the plan goes to completion those people are working <clears throat> there's currently a dispute resolution forum could, that could address any concerns that anyone has about the cost duration and services providing under rehab plan those are called rehab conferences at the Department of Labor and Industry so where an insurer for example might be concerned that the costs are become excessive they can either refuse to pay the rehab bill and have the rehab provider provide a rehab request and have a conference or they can go to the department and ask to change the rehab plan to limit services so there's already a recourse in the event that there are concerns about the costs or duration of rehab plans it's so instead of leaving that option as the way of resolving these issues this bill would put an arbitrary limit on those services without a rationale I am not aware of any study that shows that injured workers who cannot go back to work with their date of injury job or occupation get a, get a job within three months or six months <coughs> if the department is looking at data out of their own rehab statistics something you should be aware of is those are services that are different than services to most individuals those aren't denied claims totally different population that we're talking about we're talking about people where the claim, the injury is admitted liability is accepted and they are unable to return to work because of their treating doctors restrictions so I've been searching for a potential explanation for this change having a hard time finding it perhaps the issue would be cost but let's think again about the cost we know that work comp is a 1.3 billion dollar system big money we know that rehab is three percent of it others have mentioned that out of that three percent twenty seven percent goes to job placement and job development services we know that about half of that goes to job development services so we're now down to in this 1.3 billion dollar program we're down to maybe six million dollars across five thousand rehab plans a year so if this I, I have a hard time seeing this as a cost driver in the system and I believe it's a real essential component in helping injured workers get back to work so to me this is gutting the work comp rehab system now I've already mentioned I'd, that I'd, I'd, I'd just ask if you could wrap it up yes soon thank you but just go, go ahead but okay. give us some some parting thoughts if you would 
I don't see how it's in the interest of the state to do this. I do believe that the outcome will be cost shifting out of the work comp arena into taxpayer funded programs. I think there's clear expectation that that'll be the outcome. I think it will reduce the return to work rates to the detriment of injured workers. Thank you, Ms. Lauren. I, it, it sounds like you have information that will be welcomed in the discussions as we move forward. So I, I thank I'm, you for that. I'm referencing information that's provided in a public forum on the Department of Labor and Industry website. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Any, any, uh, Mr. The, Chair? Yeah, Rep. Mahoney. I, would, I hope that the committee members understand that our faith in Minnesota citizens has just been restored. Someone who actually is invested and involved and takes the time to do the research. I suspect that that would be a really good person to have on the work comp advisory council, although it would, be un, uh, uh, would not be allowed to be on it at this particular time. Uh, I'm going to close. I'm going to, we need to get this bill done and voted on and moved over to ways and means. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask one question, and that's of Representative Gunther. You and I have been on this committee for 14 years together. I've never seen a bill come out of the Work Comp Advisory Council that has had so much consternation. Am I, am, am I wrong, Representative Gunther? Uh, Representative Gunther. Uh, Representative Mahoney, you are perfectly right. I have never seen a, a issue that has caused so much debate. And uh, you and I have debated. <laughs> and uh, one thing I do know is the Work Comp Advisory Council does a very good job of talking and vetting every issue that comes before them. And there's a lot of people and organizations that put a lot of input there. And uh, I, I think, by and large, we have to pay attention to what they have to say. Mr. Chair, I would ask Mr. Mr. Mahoney. I would like to read. I would ask that the committee vote this bill out. But I certainly hope that the council, the department, and all people, and this room is full of people paid to be here on this particular issue. And as the citizen that was just testifying said, this is a $1.3 billion uh, uh, industry. And when there's $1.3 billion in an industry, somebody's making a lot of money. And really what this particular uh, or, uh, uh, system is for is to benefit injured workers, get them back to work. I think at this particular time uh, it might have uh, veered a little off its path. And uh, with Representative Kiefer, uh, hopefully she will work uh, tirelessly with me to, uh, uh, to address some issues that this bill has really brought some raw points up really raw points and you know I've got good friends on that council and I'm sure I'm I'm irritating them like like a like a burr under a saddle today right now and that's just fine because frankly one of the things I've learned at the Capitol is that if you come here wanting people to like you you're not going to do a good job so members I would ask that House file 1359 be passed to the committee on ways and means with a recommendation to pass uh, as amended, Representative Mahoney. As amended. And uh, re referred to ways and means. Um, you've heard the uh, motion before us. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion prevails and bills pass. Adjourned. 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 And uh, we're now adjourned.